one of my co-faculty at Cooper University Hospital. How you doing, Matt? Great. Thanks for having me, Haney. No, thanks for being here. Anyone that follows me and any of my content knows that I just love talks. And we had you on the Critical Care Lounge not too long ago, mm -hmm. and you crushed it. In fact, we had you back on twice, and now you're a YouTube sensation. Even your kids follow you on YouTube, is my understanding. Yeah, no, not really. Lots of eye roll on teenagers. That's how it goes, and that's <laughs> it. I understand that. We talk a lot about in this conference, we're talking about ischemic insult as causes of cardiac arrest, but occasionally, tox is a cause of cardiac arrest. and it's important for people to understand when to consider it and what therapies they need to use. So is it okay if we go through some stuff? Yeah, okay. let's do it. The first thing is something I'm sure you hear about all the time. It's high dose insulin therapy. Yep. It's sexy. It's cool. Everyone wants to know, uh, talk about, wants to talk about it. People don't always know when to use it. Yeah. So what are the indications when you're using high dose insulin therapy? Yeah, it's a great question. I think that it's also a function of comfort of the provider. I think the literature points towards early, early your utilization of hyperinsulinemia euglycemia therapy tends to make things better sooner. Mm -hmm. And I often tell people it's a little different when I'm at the bedside or talking with somebody I know versus talking with somebody because I consult for the Poison Center. So we get calls from all over the region and people haven't always learned about hyperinsulinemia euglycemia therapy. And it sounds scary, mm -hmm. right? We're talking about one unit per kilo IV push followed by one unit per kilo per hour, up to 10 units per kilo per hour of regular insulin while trying to maintain, right? This sounds terrifying mm -hmm. and reasonably right because some patients need to be maintained on a d20 infusion central line there are potential complications with hypervolemia if there's already decreased cardiac output and a combination of cardiogenic and vasoplegic shock mm -hmm. but that having been said i usually recommend this earlier on in the setting of concern for beta blocker or calcium channel blocker overdose. Okay. Now that having been said, some would argue that patients will probably do just as well with high dose vasopressors. Mm -hmm. And again, it's a lot easier for some physicians to, who don't just have experience with this to wrap their heads around just cranking up gotcha. and then adding on vasopressors as you would for any other hypotensive patient or other patient in like cardiogenic shock. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's a lot of role outside of calcium channel blocker, beta blocker poisoning. But one of the nice things about hyperinsulinemia, euglycemia therapy is also does not really increase systemic vascular resistance, mm -hmm. right? So it makes myocardial performance better because the heart isn't trying to squeeze. You use a lot of vaso, you clamp down periphery, it makes myocardial performance a lot right. more challenging. Yeah, the current recommendations seem to lean towards earlier starting gotcha. with hyperinsulinemia therapy. And the other thing that I usually will throw in is that it's sometimes difficult to predict a patient's underlying nutritional status. Mm -hmm. And because these patients are going to be on a prolonged dextrose infusion while maintaining, trying to maintain euglycemia, giving them thiamine and folate IV is really important. That's a great pearl. Now, let me ask you, when you write that order or you yep. recommend that order, I'm sure you have nurses coming over telling me what are you sure about that yeah have you ever used the line trust me i'm a doctor i did yeah it, it's really we actually had a case in the cooper er and it, it wasn't on uh, hyperinsulinemia therapy it was with uh, lipid emulsion therapy and somebody was like how does this even work anyway i was like trust me for now i didn't say i'm a doctor but i just said trust me for now because we were trying to deal with it still waiting for the opportunity to use that line <laughs> and not sound like a complete jerk and i wasn't trying to i was sure. just like i in the moment trying to do a whole bunch of things yeah, yeah. makes sense so you've already went over the dosing when is when do you start to look at the therapy and say this might not be working and and when to cease and desist and move on to something else? Yeah. I think if you're really not getting a change in your map the way you then you're finding more evidence of end organ damage, you need to maybe not take away the hyperinsulinemia. You need to make sure you're maximizing that effect and then adding on vasopressors from there. Gotcha. It's really based on your end organ perfusion, right? And then what are you monitoring and how often are you monitoring electrolytes and, and finger sticks? Yeah, ideally, initially, with the therapy, I usually recommend AccuCheck every five minutes mm. because, again, we're really 
hammering the patient with a lot of insulin, right? And so really you want to make sure you're maintaining that euglycemic state. And theoretically, once you get somebody on a dextrose infusion that's maintaining that euglycemia, you can then start spacing it out. Mm -hmm. I would ideally do Q2 hour okay. chemistry panels as well, but that's not always feasible in lab turnaround time and things like that. So it's really a function of like how efficient your lab can work. Some places where maybe they have bedside point of care testing that might be a little more feasible and getting your bedside pH and bicarb and some other stuff that could be helpful. I imagine the potassium and the bicarb and the pH are the things that you really want to know on a moment by moment basis and the other stuff can come when it comes. Yep. And some people panic and reasonably when potassium starts dropping. Mm -hmm. And I think similar to other processes like DK, we're giving lots of insulin. It's not really whole body hypokalemia and you need to gently replete it, but not go overboard. Mm -hmm. But yeah, really keeping an eye on potassium and pH and, and glucose, really some of the key parts. Cool. All right, let's shift gears and let's talk about lipid emulsion therapy. Right? People love to talk about it. Yeah. People love to see it like in the bag that has this big wonky bag yep. to it. When are you thinking that someone needs intralipid? It's a hard question to answer. It's really challenging. And the literature really almost suggests that almost no one should get it. Oh, really? Yeah. The, it's interesting. There's a whole lipid emulsion working group that talks about this and writes some very eloquent papers on it and does a really nice job of reviewing the literature. And really, their only strong recommendation is in the setting of cardiac arrest with local anesthetic toxicity, mm -hmm. or they what they call LAST, right? And really, with the best evidence in patients with bupivacaine-induced either cardiac arrest or life-threatening presentations, everything else is really neutral recommendation. Now, that having been said, clinically at the bedside, have I used it for other indications? Absolutely. But the really, the consensus working group is like really neutral recommendations. And, and part of the problem is that we, don't, we still don't know how it works. We don't know what the right dose is. We don't know what the right timing is. And we're going off some animal models that are good and some human anecdotal experience that is good. But I think early on, maybe there was some publication bias around lipid emulsion therapy where it was like very popularized and everybody was like, look, this stuff fixes everything. <laughs> and then some people took a closer look and were like, lots of patients died who got lipid emulsion. So it's really hard, again, to just echo what the working group conveys is local anesthetic toxicity, reasonable to use, neutral recommendations on most other things. For me at the bedside, a patient with a bad heterocyclic or tricyclic antidepressant overdose or other sodium channel blocker, I'm going to consider it. If they're having degenerating EKGs and hemodynamics, I'm going to try it gotcha. because there's, in the moment, it's hard to know what else to offer. If we've given them lots of bicarbonate, lots of supportive care, I'm still going to try it, but I'm, I don't have a lot of, too much hope, but yeah. I'm going to try it. But I have had clinical success in those situations. Gotcha. It's funny that you mentioned how there was this popularity for everything. I remember when I was in residency, and that's when it really started getting popular. There was a website called intralipid.org. Yeah, and lipidrescue.org. Rescue yeah. And I went there and I was scrolling through. I was like, wow, it could be for calcium channel blocker, yep. for Tylenol overdose. And then it's like a receding hairline. Wow, it does everything. <laughs> it's just, it's an amazing drug. I, I got to yeah. get my hands on this. And yeah. then, like you said, literature started to reel things back in. Yeah. Yeah. And when you look at it mechanistically, the, the early on, the big discussion was around this idea of the lipid sink phenomenon, right? And we're basically giving intravenously this a whole bunch of lipids that are just going to grab the drug if it's a lipophilic drug and prevent it from getting to the end organ that is being damaged by whatever the poisoning is. But now there are at least six mechanisms of action that are being that have been hypothesized as to how it works. And some of the mechanisms are very independent of this lipid sink phenomenon and just like improving myoc performance and other cellular things that just get better with lipid emulsion. So you're like, wow, if it does all these other things, maybe everybody should get it. Right. But the evidence doesn't really point in that direction right now. Gotcha. But as a, a, it, it is something to consider, mm -hmm. but not to have too much. Yeah. Don't hold on too much. Yeah. When you start it, what are some of the things that you want to monitor during its infusion and after? Are there any lab tests that you're worried about or any complications from it? Yeah. Lab tests really get 
messed up after you give it. So you want to get as much laboratory data as you can beforehand, and then just be prepared for the fact that a lot of your data is going to get, is not going to be very reliable mm -hmm. once you administer the lipids. So you can ask your lab to like spin samples down mm -hmm. for things that you really need and want to measure, but just be prepared for it not being reliable. Patients, risks of complications with lipid emulsion are somewhat less common, but are very real and concerning. So other clinical things to look for, ARDS has been reported, I think anaphylaxis and other just medical complications, pancreatitis, hypertriglyceridemia, things like that. Gotcha. Okay, cool. I have a favor to ask you. Yeah. This is a relatively new studio and we've been doing some work and I noticed that there's some like spackle marks on there and we didn't have time to paint. <laughs> yeah. Could I just have you just, just put like a sticker over there, just like right over there and maybe I'll put one over here. Over on this yeah, one? That's a good one. And Maybe that other one right there. I just, sure. I'm embarrassed about it, but oh, look at that. You really. I feel like this is a setup. Uh, no, that just places us a little classier right okay. now. Okay, yeah, cool. That's nice. Cool. Let me uh, switch gears and talk about methylene blue. Okay. Another thing that people just love to talk about is we should give methylene blue. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? I So I remember, I think on my, I think it was my first appearance on the Critical Care Lounge, Adam asked about it. Mm -hmm. And I was like, huh. And I really remember a conversation I had with our uh, former faculty in critical care medicine at, at, at Cooper, who didn't really feel favorably towards methylene mm. blue. And, and honestly, my recent clinical experience is it doesn't really seem to help very much. Mm -hmm. Animal models don't show, at least one animal uh, model study that was done showed mo no mortality benefit. There are, again, anecdotal case reports of patients responding to methylene blue mm -hmm. in the setting of calcium channel blocker overdose. It's a good antidote, right? We use it, we think about it usually for like methemoglobinemia. We think about it less commonly, but for press, posterior reversible encephalopathy syndrome in the setting of certain chemotherapeutics for mm -hmm. cancer. And, and then we think about it for like vasoplegic shock, right? And a lot of the, I think, literature comes from post-cabbage patients. Mm -hmm. And then it's been tried in poison patients. And my my recent clinical experience with it, it really hasn't made much of a difference, to be really? honest. Yeah. Would you say it's like a drug looking for an indication? It, it seems to be. It's got other indications, sure, right? Sure, sure. But it's not without risk also, mm -hmm. right? It's been associated with serotonin syndrome. It. What's the other? So serotonin syndrome is the big concerning one. And then- Blue um, hands on pharmacists. Yeah. Mix it up. And it's it turns your urine in a funny color, yeah. which is always- You always bring the medical students that residents over. Right. It's like, what is this? Right, right, it's right. like the one once um, a month or once every quarter that you get to do that. Yep. Yeah. But in terms of, and the mechanism has been well described, it prevents nitric oxide formation, which should help with vasoplegic shock and help with vasoplegic. So again, I think it's, it, we don't really know when to give it. It's usually given after four pressors have been administered. And now we're like, let's try the methylene blue. Right. And there's no real clear data that shows that we should be giving it earlier. So in, in the setting of vas vasoplegic shock, in the setting of poisoning, is it something we can try? Sure. Mm -hmm. But again, it's not without potential risks. And I'm not really sure how much benefit it mm -hmm. really holds. It's in some people's Hail Mary armamentarium. Yep. And so I was thinking about getting together with you and creating a drug called calcium methylene bicarb that we can okay. make. That's like the Hail Mary package. I like that. It's just one push of everything. Yep. Yeah. Let's do it. Okay, let's do it. Let's Good. Do it. We're looking to retire early. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we should loop in the, the our clinical pharmacists, I think. Yeah, but for the research stuff, we get the cash. Yeah, totally. All right, good. I like it. All right, what I want to do... Can we put an acetylcysteine in there too, just to round it out in oh, terms of antidotal treatment? Sure, we could do that. Right. I, I, we'll have to work on the branding for that, but I'm sure the marketers will come up with something. Cool. All right, I want to hit you some rapid fire questions. These are just real, real quick hit questions. Yeah. One question... And you can do one or two answers, however you like. You ready? Yeah. All right, cool. What is, and this is something I ask you every time I see you yeah. in the bubble and this question is coming. Yeah. What is something that is cutting edge and sexy in toxicology right now? Boy, I think there's been a lot of discussion around kind of management of acute. Mm -hmm. And I think in the setting of certain withdrawal syndromes, innovative use of safety of actually nasal dexmedetomidine. All right. Interesting. Okay, yeah. cool. Are toxicologists reliable friends? Yes. Okay, good, good, good answer. What is the one phone call? Actually, we'll turn off the camera for this. So no one's going to see it right now. What is the one phone call that you're getting as a toxicologist consultant that you're like, really? You're calling me for this? Oh, boy. No one's watching. Yeah, I know. Usually somebody just asking for a mechanism of action for a particular thing, something that's very easily searchable. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, cool. In your toxicology training, 
Is the Krebs cycle really necessary or is it just something used to weed out the dumb doctors? It is not necessary. Okay. Could you recite the Krebs cycle right Absolutely now? Absolutely not. I love you for that. Okay. <laughs> what is your favorite enzyme? Choline. All right. Said. Best... Or acetylcholinesterase. Acetylchol. Best tacos in Philly. Oh. This guy's a foodie for those of you who don't know. This is, yeah. That's a really hard one. I know. These are not easy uh, questions, man. I brought you. Oh, Casa Mexico. Casa Mexico. All right. Good. What's your favorite side chain? Oh, yeah. I'm a little bit removed from chemical structures. Okay. All right. Fair enough. All right. This is just rapid associations. I'll say a word and word. You say something back. Yeah. Acetaminophen. And acetylcysteine. All right. Cyanosis. Supplemental oxygen first. Justin Bieber. Don't listen to his music. Dexmedetomidine. Can be given intranasally. Boom. There you have it, folks. Dr. Matt Salzman. Thank you for being here today, yeah, answering all the questions. Me. Yeah, for sure. We'll have you back on the Critical Care Lounge. Make sure that you keep growing. You're at 1 million subscribers right now to your channel. It's amazing. Yeah. He's a very smart man. Thank you so much for being here today, Matt. Thanks for having me. Well, we'll have you back for the panel a little bit later. Awesome.